What is up, everybody? Welcome to another awesome episode of the MMA Hoodie Fight Predictions and Breakdowns. This is going to be for UFC Vegas 17, Thompson vs. Neil, happening at the UFC uh, Apex down in Vegas again. Gotta love the Apex. Before we get started, I just want to say a few things. Number one, I want to thank everybody who has supported me watching the videos early on. You know, where we've just surpassed, I think, 25 subscribers, so a quarter way to my first goal, which is 100 subs. Um, if for those of you who are new to the channel, which probably most of you are, uh, if you could give me a uh, like and subscribe and uh, hit that notify button at the end of this video, if you did like it, uh, that'd be totally, you know, much appreciated. And uh, I just plan to grow this channel and I'll continuously do these um, fight breakdowns and predictions. This is just out of love. You know, I'm not here to make some money or anything like that. I have a completely separate YouTube channel that I do that for. Uh, and yeah, this is just out of love and for fun. One thing I do want is your guys' input on things that you like about the channel, things that you don't like, things that you want to see. Be sure to also check me out on Instagram at MMA Hoodie. Uh, I just started that Instagram like the same time I started the channel, so I'd like to see that grow as well. Uh, I'd be posting just uh, quick updates and notifications on there. Also, if you didn't catch my first recap video, so I actually did a recap video of 256 because it was just such an awesome card. Uh, we don't really do that in these uh, videos, so I'm gonna strictly do recap videos for the UFC events, but not for fight nights or contender series or anything like that. So anything that's a UFC event uh, will be followed a few days after the event with a recap video. And just a few other things to mention in recent news uh, for just UFC and MMA in general, things that you guys might want to check out. It looks like Rumble Johnson is going to go to Bellator. Uh, that's pretty interesting. Uh, and then also, as I predicted, uh, Rachel Ostovich is no longer going to be in the UFC. She is packing her bags and being sent away. Uh, well wishes to her. But I told you guys that if she did not perform in this fight, she is on her way out. That's exactly what happened. Also, there's a UFC class action lawsuit that's apparently going to move forward. Uh, it might cost them roughly like one to two billion dollars. Um, so if you guys are interested in those uh, stories, you guys can look them up on Google. I just, I figured I'd mention them just as highlights before we get started. There's one more thing we're going to talk about, but not until we get into the Anthony Pettis fight, because it kind of relates to that. Either way, I hope you guys have a great holiday, a uh, great season. I hope you're all staying safe. Um, you know, it kind of, we're kind of in a shitty situation right now but you know it seems like the world is starting to move forward and hopefully 2021 will bring in uh some good things for everybody so i just hope you're all doing well and uh yeah let's get right into it this is a fight that i'm actually not even sure if it's happening anymore because ufc updated the roster last night and i checked it and cody durden and jimmy flick is not on the roster but everywhere else they're on the roster and I know UFC updated their roster last night because the Bilal Muhammad fight uh, got canceled. And this is actually why I do these uh, predictions a lot later. Um, I usually wait for middle of the week because by Wednesday, usually a couple fighters or a couple fights have been canceled or shifted around. And a lot of these other prediction guys post like super early in the week, which is good on them. But for me, I don't want to do a prediction and then have the fight not happen. So I kind of waited out until middle of the week to know exactly, you know, I've got a better chance of hitting all the uh, fight cards. I know UFC updated their fight card yesterday. Uh, they did not add Cody Durden and Jimmy Flick, but they added Robertson uh, and Santos. So I'm and they took away the Bilal Muhammad fight. Uh, so if this fight isn't part of the card, I'll try to cut it out. Um, if I do find out before the edit goes live, uh, if not, you have my prediction anyway. So Cody Durden versus Jimmy Flick. Flick has been knocked out before two times. Uh, and he also has 13 wins by submission, which is like awesome. Uh, two by decision though. Uh, Durden has five of his wins by knockout, but also five by submission. So right away, this tells me that 
this fight probably won't go the distance. I could already say that. Um, I, I believe that that won't be the case. It's, it's not going to go the distance. Now, although Flick is moving down from Bantamweight, he does have the better submission skills. However, I don't know if he can rely on that the entire fight. Because if he goes for sub after sub after sub and Durden is just able to defend or just use his power essentially to take away those opportunities for Flick, Flick is kind of out of options. And Durden does have more power and he could still look for the takedown because he has the wrestling as well. So if they do go to the ground, it's going to be wrestling versus this sort of jujitsu and uh, I guess grappling is going to come into the game as well. But both these guys might look to stay standing to avoid the ground game. We've seen this happen with ground fighters in the past where it's two fighters that do well on the ground. They tend to stand up. In fact, last week we saw it with the Jandaroba fight and Mackenzie Dern. Shout out to Mackenzie Dern for just fighting through that broken nose or whatever and like putting it back in place against the cage. That was insane. Uh, we talk about that in the recap that I did. So if you guys want to check that out, you can go ahead and do so. Based on their performances, I really don't see this going all three rounds. Um, that, that like I can almost, I want to say I almost guarantee, but I never guarantee anything guys. Never, it's MMA. Anything can happen. At the end of the day, Durden doesn't want to offer a submission opportunity for Flick. But Flick doesn't also want to get out wrestled or get pinned to the ground and be looking for subs off his back the whole time. So I think the odds in general should be closer. They may have moved since I last checked. Uh, and Durden might be a little bit un underestimated uh, in this fight here. I think it'll be a close fight. It's a very tough pick for me. Uh, I think originally I was hot on Durden like I really thought that he would maybe overwhelm Flick but I think that Flick's submission skills and just the way that he can defend against Durden might be able to help him out a lot here and if Flick is for real if his submission skills are for real which they seem to be 13 wins by subs I can't really go against that the only thing that worries me here is that Flick has been knocked out before twice as I mentioned uh, and Durden does have that power. So can Durden catch Flick? Uh, you know, that's going to play a factor. Do they go to the ground? That's going to be the other factor. But in this fight, I'm just going to have to go with Jimmy Flick. I think that he will have more opportunities for the submission uh, than Durden will uh, for the power shot. Uh, next up, we have Tafan Nchukwi uh, versus Jamie Pickett. Uh, Nchukwi is 4-0, and and he has fought all his fights, won them by knockout. Uh, Pickett has eight wins by knockout. So once again, is this a fight that's going to go the distance? It's in the smaller cage. Uh, a lot of these fights have ended early in the smaller cage. I believe this is going to be one of those fights. Uh, I'll guarantee this one. Stamp of approval. And Chikwi, he's constantly improving. He's an upcoming fighter. You know, he's still got room to grow and still has lots to learn. Um, he's fought against decent competition outside of the UFC, which I think is pretty important. Uh, Pickett on the other side is a little older. He's moving up in weight. Um, you know, why is he moving up in weight? Uh, you know, is this going to be a more competitive, uh, pace for him? Is this going to be a more difficult weight class? Uh, we're going to have to wait and see what happens there. Both of these guys can get the knockout. So that's where I see this ending early, clearly. Um, I don't think any of them are going to look to go the distance. Both of these guys are going to bring it. Uh, and at the end of the day, to be quite honest, I think uh, it comes down to whether Pickett can handle the power of Nchukwi. And of course, we haven't seen Nchukwi fight, fight too much yet. Like, he's only had four fights. But man, like, you could see the power, like, in his fight like you could see in the fights that he's had uh how much power he really holds as fights continue and go on i could see that be a problem for him but if he can keep ending them early then you know he's gonna have no problem keeping that power and throwing those power shots but how far does that get you right so i'm not saying that nchukwi is like the best fighter in the world here uh but I do see him to win this fight against Pickett. And it's not just about the punches either. Actually, both these guys, I guess, have good power in their legs as well. But Nchukwi just has this slight edge in power that you could really notice. And he's still fairly quick for the amount of power and size he brings. So I could see all of that be a problem for Pickett. I'm going to go with Nchukwi by knockout. Next up, Ayman Zahabi versus Draco Rodriguez. 
Uh, guys, this is going to be my least confident pick of the night. Um, I see pros and cons to both these fighters. Uh, I'm on right away is a hobby that last name you guys probably know and by the fact that he trains at TriStar you already know that he is a relative uh, Faraz Sahabi. Um, so, you know, for that fact, you know, he's got good training, you know, he's got good coaching. Uh, this might bring a problem for Draco because I don't see Zahabi taking this fight, not thinking he can win. Uh, Tristar is a very, like they're very big on strategy and I feel like their coaches know when to bring a fighter into a specific fight, when they know that they have a very good chance of winning, but it's also going to be competitive. Uh, there's one thing that I notice about TriStar fighters, and it's that they're always fighting against competition that um, is competitive. Like, they're not looking for these people they know they could beat. And I think that's where it both benefits and hinders them, because on one hand, they're competing, they're elevating their game, they're fighting against the better fighters. But on the other hand, like it brings about more losses. So it can make their team look a little uh, subpar. They're not subpar. So don't get me wrong when I say use that word or term. I know some of you get offended easily. Uh, but they're not subpar. But what I mean by that is that uh, they can look lackluster, even though they're actually really good and skilled. You know, Zahabi has three of his seven wins by knockout, and the other three are by submission. So only one of his wins has gone to decision. Draco, on the other hand, has four of his seven wins by submission, and then two by knockout, right? So these guys haven't really gone to decision, either of them. Uh, I think they've, they've both got really good potential, but Draco is the younger fighter by almost 10 years. Still has a lot to learn, but also has, you know... Uh, a lot of momentum on his side. You know, he's obviously getting better as he goes on with his fighting. Uh, he's clearly working his way into the UFC. Zahabi, you know, he doesn't fight that often. Um, and he needs to pick up that pace of fighting regularly. I don't know why he's not fighting often. Uh, he does train at Team TriStar, as I mentioned. So, like, you figure, especially the fact that his relatives are his coaches, that they would kind of pump him into the mix a little more. But I think where the problem lies is that Zahabi has had issues beating good competition in the past. Um, and I think that's why he doesn't take too many fights too often. And this goes back with what I mentioned earlier about TriStar being a very uh, strategy-based uh, coaching staff. Uh, not just as far as the actual in-cage uh, coaching, but also the strategy around who their fighters will fight. Um, so I think although they think Zahabi, this is a good fight for Zahabi, uh, I think this is also going to be a highly competitive fight. I think Zahabi does come in here with obviously the more experience and maybe the better fight IQ even. But Rodriguez is really showing himself, uh, you know, he's coming in like new and we've seen these young gun fighters, especially recently being popped into the UFC. A lot of them are making noise. Uh, and Rodriguez might be one of them. So in this fight, I'm going to go with Rodriguez, but it is my least confident pick of the night, guys. So keep that in mind. I can't stress that enough. Least confident pick, but Draco Rodriguez. Uh, so next up, we have Duran Wynn versus Antonio Arroyo. Arroyo has four wins by sub and four by knockout. Duran has four wins by knockout as well, which is pretty surprising, actually. Uh, Arroyo doesn't have the best cardio, and he might have problems with grappling or wrestling that Duran will bring. Uh, but Arroyo has been training for a fight for quite some time. You know, he I think he's had three fights that were all canceled, like back to back. Uh, so he's been constantly training and for different fighters, right? So these three fights weren't against the same opponent. Uh, they just happened to be back to back fights that all got uh, postponed or canceled. Arroyo, like. Um, he has been training for this fight, but he doesn't have the best cardio. He hasn't fought in just over a year, I think, was his last fight. Uh, but he's more likely the fighter that's been training harder. I can almost guarantee that. Uh, on the other side, you got Duran Wynn. You know, he's pretty small and stocky for the division. He will have a significant height disadvantage. I think Arroyo will also have about a three or three and a half inch reach advantage on him. You know, Duran has looked, hasn't looked great in the past, uh, especially recently. But, you know, he seems promising. You know, I feel like 
this is this guy who has all the skills. He's working with a great team. Maybe he just doesn't have like the full on discipline that everybody at AKA has. I know he's run into some problems recently. Uh, he also has missed weight once before, um, maybe even more than once before. And we saw Duran win early on was like kind of hyped up. I don't know if this was like because of Daniel Cormier and the connection there, but uh, you know, he did come in with a lot of promise, a lot of heart. Uh, and was a little hyped up, but I haven't really been impressed with any of his performances at all. At all. And here I really do believe Duran needs a win. He needs to win this fight. This is sort of like that Ostovich situation that I mentioned, and we saw what happened there, right? I called that. I could see Duran being that fighter that comes into the UFC and then kind of has to leave and then comes back later on. Uh, you know, a new, better version, more mature version of him. Um, and then also it's like, what weight class are you in? Like, what, find your place. And if you're not disciplined enough to hit 170, uh, you know, you're going to run into problems at these bigger weight classes when you're a super smaller guy uh, in, in size comparison to them. So at this point, I kind of break this down as a discipline, as a, as a more discipline problem uh, for Duran Win. Maybe that's something that people are overlooking. I'm not sure. But let me know what you guys think about Duran down in the comments below. Uh, maybe uh, I have a bit of a foggy perception on him. Maybe I'm missing something. But that's just how I feel. I'm being honest. And I love AKA. I love DC and, and everything. Like, I, I wish Duran the best. But I just feel the same way about Duran as I do about Ostovich. Uh, just clearly not there yet or now. Now, where Duran does stand a chance is if he brings the wrestling into the mix. If he can get Arroyo down, then his chances improve dramatically. But he cannot rely on that takedown the whole time. So if we see for three rounds, Duran win is constantly just trying to push for that takedown, push for that takedown, and it's getting stuffed time after time, and he's not getting it, and Arroyo is slowly picking him apart and taking his shots, uh, you know, then... Duran is just going to gas himself out by the third round and, you know, we're going to see Arroyo over time take over that fight. Uh, so although I do see Duran looking for the wrestling, looking for the takedown, if he doesn't get those, he's effed for the rest of the fight. Like, unless he gets that lucky punch, he's screwed for the rest of the fight. Um, as such, I do usually go for the fighter that has more opportunities to win and more tools under their belt. In this case, I think Arroyo has that. So I'm going for Antonio Arroyo uh, for the win. I think it'll just go to decision for this one. I think he'll pick him apart over time. So we're on Carl Roberson versus Dolce Lundiambula. Uh, Roberson has four wins by submission and two wins by knockout. Three of his wins are also by decision. Dolce, on the other hand, has five wins by KO and uh, one by sub, as well as four by decision. So a pretty scattered mix as far as how they win. Uh, Dolce, on, on one hand, is moving down a weight class into middleweight, uh, so he'll have a two-inch reach advantage as well, so he might be the bigger fighter here. Um, Roberson, on the other hand, better striking capabilities and power. I was thinking this the whole week. And then I went and I kind of looked more at fight tape, because as soon as I thought this, I'm like, okay, why won't I pick Carl? And it's because I don't really know Carl's fighting that much. Like, I haven't really seen him fight that often. So I went back and I kind of looked at their tape on both ends. And then I thought, okay, in the octagon, Carl actually fights a lot better in style. So I feel like Roberson has a bit of a better fighter technique and fighting style. Um, and watching him fight actually changed uh, my mind on who would pick the, who would win this fight. Uh, so for that fact, I'm going with Roberson. Um, I did like what I see. Not to take anything away from Dolce, you know, if he gets a knockout here or he gets the odd sub if he can do it, um, then great. But to be quite honest, uh, I was imp more impressed with the tape that I saw in Roberson than I saw in Lungiambula. So for that fact, I'm going to go with Roberson here. Uh, this is like my second least confident pick of the night. And it's only because I don't know Roberson that well. I'm being honest. All right, next up, we got Sejara Ubanks versus Penny Kianzad. Uh, so for this one, I'm going to say right away, it's a no bet for me or live bet it. Uh, there are too many variables here uh, for both fighters. 
So Jara on one hand has been looking promising, but she did lose her last fight. Uh, she has, however, stepped up her game in both striking and, you know, we know she's good on the ground. Uh, we've seen her compete with a lot of ground com competition that uh, are skilled fighters on the ground and she's, you know, been able to match them, uh, in some cases outweigh them. And Penny has three wins by knockout and uh, 10 by decision. I always get interested when I see that a female fighter has a win by knockout, only because it, it, we don't see it that often, let's be honest. I'm not hating against females here or anything like that. It's just when I see uh, any uh, female fighter that has like at least a handful of knockouts, then you know she has at least some power in her punches. But Penny isn't a highlight fighter. You know, she's not memorable. Like really think about it. Give me one fight that you remember of Panties that, you know, blew your mind. I, I can't even think of one. You know, like, to, to remember who Panny fought, I have to look back on, like, Topology or something. But she has beat some good fighters overall. Uh, however, if you look at the sort of fight history and the timeline there, a couple of those fighters were also going through ruts at the time. So they were losing, or they had lost their previous fight, or they lost against Panny, then they lost again. I think this is going to be a little closer than people expect. Um, I think it can go either way. But once again, going with the person who has more tools under the belt, seems to be more skilled, doing well uh, recently, uh, showing up at every fight. Uh, I'm going to have to go with Sajara Eubanks here. Uh, nothing against Panny. As I said, this is a no bet for me uh, or live bet. So let's go into round one, see what happens between the two and go from there. But for me right now, I'm going to say Sajar Banks takes the win by decision. So next up, we were supposed to have Bilal Muhammad and Diego Lima. Uh, that fight got canceled because B uh, Bilal Muhammad tested positive for COVID. So to take its place, we got Anthony P Pettis versus Alex Morono. Um, Pettis does take this fight on short notice. He's uh, also going back on the news that we were talking about earlier uh, that I wanted to mention about Pettis. His social media, he released that he has uh, started a new MMA management company uh, called the Showtime Group. So look into that because I think this is that might play a little factor into what's going on here. Pettis does have eight wins by knockout, nine by submission. Alex has five wins by knockout, six by submission. Uh, so both of these guys can end this before end this early. Pettis, though, he's fought the better competition in the past in comparison to Morono, but he's also been beat by the best. Pettis probably thinks he's got the easy win here. And some might think that Morono kind of needs to beat some better level competition before he works his way up to somebody as skilled as Anthony Pettis. And, you know, as I mentioned, Pettis does have the experience with the top tier fighters in the UFC. And I really want to know what his plans are. Because his brother just took off to, the, to Bellator. Now Anthony releases that he's, uh, you know, opening a management company called Showtime Group. How much actual involvement does Anthony have in this group? Uh, and then is he kind of trying to work his way out of fighting and being more... Oh, my dog just sneezed. Uh, is he trying to work his way out of fighting and more into the management and business side of things? If that's the case, then how seriously is he taking this fight? And Pettis does have the slightly better stand-up game. Uh, that's mainly due to the fact that he's pretty quick and accurate in his shots. But to be quite honest, people could be sleeping on Morono. A lot of people have Pettis to win this fight. Um, I think it's going to end early regardless who wins. If the odds are wide enough, I would pick Morono. Like, why not? I think he's got a good chance to beat Pettis. I don't know where Anthony uh, Pettis' mindset is. And to be quite honest, a lot of people might be uh, dodging Morono, thinking that he's not as skilled as Pettis. But man, these two wouldn't be fighting if it wasn't going to be a competitive fight. And I do agree that Anthony probably took this fight thinking he would win, like it's a clear win for him. And he does have the upper hand. Maybe he does because he's fought better fighters and he's been there, done that. But uh, don't count somebody who's working their way up out. You know, we've seen a fight. Look what Kevin Holland did last week, right? A lot of people had Yakareta win that fight. Look at Charles Oliveira. I mean, mind you, Oliveira has been in the game for quite some time too. But these guys come up, they work their way up and there's always a transition. And, you know, Anthony Pettis hasn't been at the very top of the top, you know, for a little bit. Uh, not a hot minute, but a little bit. 
So for that fact, I'm going to go with Morono. And if the odds are wide enough, I would bet Morono. Um, but yeah, Morono, let's just say by knockout. I think both of these guys have enough uh, knockouts and subs under their belts that one of these guys is going to get knocked out or submitted. Um, so I'm going to say Morono by knockout. All right, next up, we got Jillian Robertson versus Talia Santos. So both of these girls had fights lined up recently that, that got canceled. Uh, both have been training for the fight and are active fighters. Robertson, on one hand, has won six fights by submission. And Santos has won ten fights by knockout. I think what's going to happen here is Robertson is going to look for the ground game and submission attempts. Uh, Robertson will try to use her grappling to overwhelm Santos. And Robertson, she's coming off some good wins and even some good losses against great opponents. She's had good coaching, but now she's moving to a new coaching team. And this can bring about some new skills and new tools for her, for sure. But it could also hinder her game. And by that, I mean, like, any new experience, it takes time to get comfortable. Like, maybe these new coaches, like, coach differently. Maybe she's not used to the style or the new things that she's learning. Maybe they kind of touch on different parts of her game and kind of let go of other parts that were working really well. And I mean, Santos has good experience herself. She could push the pressure. She could be quite aggressive. She's got the five inch reach advantage. So she could really use those jabs and those strikes to keep Jillian at bay, uh, keep Jillian from getting in, uh, pulling the grappling and uh, getting Santos down and looking for the submission. Santos should try to keep this fight standing at all costs. Um, as long as she keeps her range and distance, maybe uses leg kicks, uses those jabs as I mentioned, uh, you know, plays the long game, uh, she could probably easily uh, try and pick apart Jillian out. The problem is, Jillian's a tough girl. She's a tough cookie. Uh, she doesn't mind taking a couple hits. She'll get in there. She'll brawl for a few seconds if she has to, just to get the clinch. Once she gets the clinch, she'll, she's going to look for the takedown. She's going to look to take you down. So I think that's Jillian's game plan. And I'm not sure if Santos could keep Jillian at bay. Uh, she might be able to do that with other fighters, other female fighters, but Jillian's not one to sort of like back down. She's one to sort of go more into a fight, even if she's being pressured. The problem for Robertson here is that Santos does have good takedown defense and striking defense. If Robertson can't get Santos down, then Santos will most likely win this fight by decision or knockout. I think this all comes down to Robertson's uh, grappling skills and takedown skills. If, As I said, if she could take Santos down, this is her fight. Um, I'm going to give it to Robertson for that fact, but also because she's Canadian and I'm Canadian. And you know what else I'm figuring out? A bunch of these other people on YouTube who also do fight predictions seem to be Canadian. Uh, so there's a lot of love out of Canada for UFC and specifically predicting fights, I guess. Um, so shout out to all the other Canadian fight prediction people out there. Uh, props to all y'all. If you're Canadian, put a thumbs up down below. Uh, hit that like button. If you're not Canadian, hit the like button anyway, because why not? All right, next up, we got Marcin Tabura versus Greg Hardy. Man, I wasn't really high on Greg Hardy when he first came into the UFC, uh, as most of you probably weren't. Um, but recently he's kind of grown on me. I mean, you look at Tabura, he does have seven wins by knockout and six by sub, which is like huge. That just shows great fight IQ in my opinion. Um, and I mean, there's people who have better, uh, records than that, but, uh, just, I mean, f for this fight specifically, uh, Hardy does have six wins by KO and I think he's only fought six or seven times. I think one of his fights, uh, either was a disqualification or a no contest, um, yeah, I'm pretty sure it was. So he's got six wins by knockout. I think Marcin's going to look to take Hardy down to the ground on this fight, or at least he should. Uh, Hardy needs to defend those takedowns and stuff Tiberia's attempts. If Tiberia can match that, uh, he will test Hardy uh, and push him to a limit that Hardy might not be used to yet, depending on the caliber of fighters that he's been fighting recently. And the problem here that I have is both of these fighters are looking good. Uh, Tiberia does have the more experience, but wasn't looking too good up until recently. Like, he's made a strong push recently. You know, Tiberia might have the better fight IQ to draw Hardy into his game plan. Um, but Hardy could, you know, be cautious. He might know that what Tiberia is coming in with 
as long as his coaching is kind of his coaching staff has sort of put that in his mind uh you know hardy might be looking to use tools to keep tibera out of distance and out of range and i do believe that as the fight goes on hardy will have more problems to deal with uh both of these guys have been fairly active so there's not much to say in that realm but tibera could grind out hardy and he'll also look to play a safe game as i said he's got better fight iq than hardy so as the fight goes on I see Tybura being able to make more adjustments in his game plan than Hardy would. But man, Hardy's just got like such good performance and great size and physique. You know, I don't know how that plays a huge factor against Tybura because like at the same time, Hardy might end up getting drawn into Tybura's game and gas out as the fight continues. So if he gets taken down, that's going to be a problem, but... You know, Hardy is slowly working his way up. He's not rushing himself. You know, he is taking on highly skilled fighters and slowly working his way up the food chain as he goes instead of just, you know, rushing to the top and taking like the best of the best. He's just slowly fight, like warming up into and that's what I appreciate about Hardy. He's not rushing himself into a top spot. He has six wins by knockout. Uh, anybody who does this would probably uh, be a lot further ahead uh, as far as the, the level of competition they're fighting. But we've seen a lot of people get striked down when that happens. Um, I'm glad with the approach that Hardy is taking uh, along with his coaching staff. I think this is really smart to ease your way into these better fighters. And I think Tiberia is going to be his first big test. Because like Hardy has a late start to MMA. Tibera doesn't. And... That's where this fight kind of gets difficult for me because I feel like Hardy will have the better power and if he lands a punch, Tibera might take it and get knocked out. Um, but Tibera might be able to avoid those just based on his experience in fight IQ. Being able to uh, beat fighters who maybe have the same skill set as Hardy, he could get it done. However, if Hardy does win this, it would be huge for him. So I'm going to go with Greg Hardy for this fight, just simply because he's really performing well lately. I think this is going to be a heavy test for uh, Hardy, um, and I think it's one that he might be able to win. If he does win this fight, then I have high hopes for Hardy moving forward. Um, but, you know, I'm not holding my breath. I'm picking Hardy, but Tiberi could win just based off experience. So... Uh, this is kind of a pick em in my opinion, but I'm rolling with Hardy. Next up, we got Marlon Moraes versus Rob Font. Man, Moraes has 10 wins by knockout and 6 by submission, and Font has 7 wins by knockout and 4 by submission. How much you want to bet this fight doesn't go the distance? Um, the thing here that is that as far as the fight experience goes, you guys know I love talking about fight experience, but we know Moraes has the more fight experience. Uh, the problem here is, can Moraes come back from the losses he's had recently? Uh, and they've been disappointed, lo disappointing losses. You look at the Cejudo fight, the Sanhagen fight. Sanhagen, he got kicked uh, to the head and just went out. Um, beautiful kick by Sanhagen. Uh, and then the Cejudo fight where he was winning and then just lost because he essentially started gassing out. And Cejudo, just what a trooper in that fight. Uh, you know, Moraes took a tough loss against those two fighters, and he does tend to gas out as the fight continues. The huge problem for me with Moraes here is, like, when you hear him in interviews, and you hear him talk about himself and his fighting, he's so confident that you believe him, you believe he's gonna win. There are many times where I've seen, like, his interviews, I'm like, yeah, man, this guy, like, he looks good, he's in shape, like, he's probably, like, one of the better shaped people in his division, um... But And then, you know, he talks a big game and, you know, he believes in himself. But that belief hasn't really shown anything for me. So when I hear guys that hype themselves up but, you know, don't end up showing up to the game or end up uh, being their own demise like he was in the Cejudo fight, for example, um, I truly sort of forget about their talk in their interview game. I don't even bother listening to it anymore because it doesn't mean anything. It's just going to screw up my mind and my mind and the, my thoughts on the fight uh, specifically. But Font hasn't really fought this past year and he also tends to take long breaks between fights. The thing is like he has had impressive fights and as well as like that knockout ability we talked about and a few submissions. Uh, so, you know, he's he's got the capabilities. But if you watch him fight, he's kind of like this static fighter who I don't think he, like, moves around a lot. He, he kind of seems flat-footed. 
Marias, he's constantly active, constantly training. You know, he might have had some losses recently, but he, once again, fighting top tier competition. Font will have this like four and a half to five inch reach advantage on him, which is, you know, pretty wide. Once it gets to like five inches or more, that, that's like a huge differential. Font could just try to keep him at bay with a jab. And I think Font's game plan going into this fight is just gonna be to gas out Marias over the rounds as they go on get uh, Marais to sort of put a lot of output, especially early, uh, defend that output, and then sort of slowly pick him apart as the fight continues. And the problem that I have with Marais, once again, like great fighter, and he can beat Font, you know, like he's got speed, he's got power, but that power and that speed comes with a price, and that price is gas, and he gasses himself out. So he, I think in this fight, he should just be more conservative, especially with his leg kicks. As this fight continues, I give it going more and more to Font. Of course, Marias has the better fight skills. He does have the better fights under his belt. Um, so for that fact, I am going with Marias to win this fight. Next up, Michelle Pereira versus Chaos Williams. Pereira, 10 wins by knockout and 7 by submission. Williams has 6 wins by knockout and 1 by submission. Man, Williams does have knockout power, but if Pereira could play a solid defensive game like he did in his last fight, he could keep Williams at bay. Uh, you know, but Williams is on a winning streak. Uh, he will have a four inch reach advantage. Both of these guys are all about knockouts though. I like, I can't stress that enough. Pereira was much more conservative in his last fight, but he threw some unpredictable shots and did some of those crazy moves that he does. Uh, and the funny thing is he was winning the fight and I'm like, I had a bet on him and I'm like, please stop, like don't, just stop, like you were playing a great conservative game and now you're going to ruin it with these wild shots again. But man, he, he brought it and he showed that he can mix the two together. I think that's something that he should do in this fight. I could see Williams looking for the knockout, but I could also see Pereira being a little too quick for him to actually uh, get that done. Both of these fighters are confident though. Uh, so don't let that take away from either of them. Uh, just because Pereira does these fancy moves doesn't mean Chaos won't bring it. Chaos is on an eight fight win streak though. You know, he's doing really well. Uh, he's beating pretty good fighters. Uh, so for that fact, for this fight, I'm going to go Chaos Williams and I'm going to say he does it by knockout. Next up, Jose Aldo versus Marlon Vera. Man, another great fight. Aldo has 16 wins by knockout, Vera has 6 wins by knockout, but also 8 by submission. Um, Aldo is in a bit of a pettis situation, as I mentioned uh, before. You know, he's lost a lot of great fights, but they were against top tier fighters. And he's beat some of those uh, great fighters as well. Uh, so even recently, like, although he's had losses, like, they've been good, decent, competitive fights. Vera though, he's been improving and legitimately becoming a threat over time. He completely shut down Sean O'Malley and I don't care what you say about, oh, you, he hit a nerve, blah, blah. How many other fighters have you seen do that? Name one, right? So when you see a fighter able to do that, you know, they have this tool in their uh, tool belt that they can use that other fighters are now gonna be aware of, right? Aldo's gonna come into this fight expecting that same leg kick and he's gonna try to avoid it before it even happens, I promise you. So Vera doesn't even have to use that kick. He could just threaten it and just, you know, uh, faint, faint the kick or, you know, just pretend that he's gonna throw a kick just to scare Marlon or, or just to scare Aldo early on. Vera's also on a six fight win streak. And I mean, although Aldo has had a bumpy run recently, as I mentioned, he has had good fights and he's looking way better. Um, I do have a lot of questions in regards to Aldo's future and his abilities to compete at the top level at least. And another problem here is that Vera does usually start off slow and will look to play the stand-up game and maybe against the cage and sort of beat Aldo over time. I think fight IQ is going to play a huge factor in this fight as well. Uh, you know, which of these guys is going to have the better game plan and strategy going in and then round by round. And going back to the leg kicks, like, not only does Vera have good leg kicks, uh, Aldo has good leg kicks. So, will both these guys be avoiding each other's legs? Will both of these guys be kicking each other's legs? Uh, these are all uh, the different dynamics that are going to determine who can win this fight. 
The problem here is that like Jose Aldo and Marlon Vera are really close in the rankings, so there's not many fights between them that they could have done. But I, I think this is a good test for uh, Vera. You know, is he going to work break the top ten? If he beats Jose Aldo, then he's in the top ten, um, and that'd be interesting to see. Or are we going to see Aldo hold his position in the top ten? I think this is a really important fight for Aldo, especially for his future. Um, this is going to determine the path that both of these guys are going to take moving forward. Uh, clearly, if Vera wins, he's going to be uh, fighting against top 10 contenders. And I don't think he's going to be fighting against number 9 or 8. I think he might be fighting against number 6. They might st uh, start pushing him up if he looks really good in this fight. And I mean, if Aldo loses, then he's out of the top 10 essentially. So where does he go from here? I do see this fight staying on the feet. Um, it's going to be a true test for both these guys. It's going to determine their path for sure. Um, is Vera for real? Is Aldo still in the game and at the top of the food chain? For now, I do have to side with Vera just simply because he is winning the fights. He is improving. He is getting better. Uh, not to take away from Aldo, but he's been around for a while. And he does fight a hard fight, but he just doesn't come through in the end and hasn't recently. So how could I pick him? Uh, I think a lot of people are on the Aldo hype train and, you know, this isn't Jose Aldo from four, five, six years ago anymore, guys. You know, uh, things happen. We move on. Anderson Silva, you know, he was once like the best of the best and now you just don't want to see him fight. So for all that, I got Marlon Vera to win this fight. But guys, let me know what you think comment down below because this is also one that I was really debating on. Um, I have nothing against Aldo. I want, you know, all the best to him as a fighter. But when it comes to this fight right now and at this time and given the circumstance, situation and st statistics um, and what they have to show for it, I got to go with Vera. Next up, it's the main event of the night. Stephen Wonderboy Thompson against Jeff Neal. So we're going to wrap this up quite quickly. So Neil has good boxing and striking, but he needs to worry about his gas tank. It has come to hurt him in the past, that's for sure. And Thompson's going to pick up the pace as the fight goes on, and he's going to use his movement to outperform Neil. Neil has a pretty solid chin though, so, you know, I can't confirm a knockout opportunity for Thompson here. Uh, this will be a good test for Neil. We are going to find out if he can fight against the better ranked fighters. Um, and he's looked great recently. Neil is on a winning streak and he's seven years younger than uh, Wonderboy. But once again, a bit of an Aldo situation. Thompson has had some big losses recently against tough competition. You know, Vincente Luque, Anthony Pettis, uh, Till, Woodley. And that fight to Till, I think he lost by decision. It was in England. It might have been a split decision. I can't remember. It was a while ago. But yeah, like even those fights couple of them might have been able to go either way and this is a five round fight and Thompson's been there done that I don't think Neil has been in a five round fight before uh, or at least not in the UFC um, you know and Neil as I said he's beat decent competition but Thompson has uh, had better fight experience has beat better fighters uh, he's also lost to better fighters and I feel like Thompson is all about strategy and technique I only see Neil winning this fight by a knockout, but I feel like catching Thompson is going to be difficult. If Thompson is to win, then the fight's likely probably going to go to decision if that's the case. This is a really tough pick for me. Uh, it really is. Um, on one hand, I kind of feel like Neil's going to win simply because uh, he is performing well. He is the younger fighter. Uh, you know, he's up and coming. He does have the power. Uh, can he knock out Thompson? Can he fight to that level? Um, I'm unsure, but I just really like what I'm seeing in Neil's recent record. You know, he's only had one win uh, by unanimous decision in like his last, I don't know, eight fights, seven fights, and he's on a seven fight win streak. All his other fights, uh, you know, they've ended by ground and pound, head kick, punches, rear naked choke. And if you guys have watched my previous videos, you know I like somebody who can win in dynamic ways, in different ways, and isn't just knockout punch every time, isn't just a decision every time. You know, they could pull the submission, they could pull the choke, they could pull a head kick. And I feel like Neil is going to bring this uh, to Thompson, and if Thompson can't keep Neil at bay, 
uh, Neil will win. So for this fight, I actually do have Jeff Neil to win this fight. Um, and I feel like it's going to end early. I think he might do it by knockout. All right, guys, that is the end of my fight prediction. I'm sure we have a few picks that are the same and I'm sure we have a few that are different. Tell me if you think I'm wrong. Comment down below. I want to know your picks too, uh, because hey, you might change my mind. Uh, somebody did comment a few videos back. Uh, they weren't really happy with one of my picks and they kind of got pretty upset about it, especially since I was wrong. Uh, I did lose that pick, I guess. But please, guys, if you're going to come on my channel and, uh, you know, maybe mock a pick of mine or say that I was wrong, at least put your picks in the comments before the fight so that you know, I know what your pick is beforehand. If you're coming in after the fight, after the fact, you didn't even tell me who you were picking, and then you're just finding one of my videos where I had an incorrect pick, well, you know, go find the ones where I didn't have an incorrect pick and, you know, compare those apples to oranges because I can promise you in some of my uh, fight predictions, I've actually been pretty on the ball with not just the prediction itself, but also how the fight would play out. Um, the Suma Derji versus uh, Malcolm Gordon video, for example, is one perfect case of that. Even the Jennifer Maya fight with Shevchenko, I said that uh, Maya might actually have a good chance here. Uh, you know, don't don't bet too much against her. And she almost beat Shevchenko. She was looking like she was winning the first two rounds. So you know, we're not always going to agree, guys. You know, like we are all going to have different predictions, different bets. Uh, the purpose of this video is to just share like my predictions and to get yours. So do me a favor, leave your predictions in the comment. Let me know what I missed. Maybe I'm missing something on one of the fights that is a valuable uh, information that I might need to know and might cause me to change my bet. So if you guys do leave comments, I do give you guys shout outs on the next video uh, if you get your predictions right. And once again, I want to thank you guys for watching. If you watched the full breakdown video, much appreciated. Uh, if you're watching just the small little clips, those are cool too. Uh, thank you so much. Either way, I really appreciate it. If you do hit that subscribe and like button and that notification button, it does help me out. It does expose me more into the search and allow others to find me that are looking for fight predictions. And we do know how difficult it is to get found on YouTube lately. My goal at the moment is to get to my first 100 subscribers. We are a quarter of the way there. Uh, and I do want to give a quick high five. Thank you. And a fist bump to everybody who has subscribed. The first 25 people who have subscribed so far. And also don't forget about my other videos and the recap. If you guys want to watch that, check it out. You can also check me out on Instagram at MMA Hoodie. That being said, another thing that I want to ask you guys is how long do you want these videos to be? Uh, I did longer ones before. I see a lot of people doing like 10 minute ones. Then other people are doing like two hours, three hours almost. Um, you know, I don't think I could go for two or three hours, but, uh, I think the 30 minute range is usually pretty good for the full breakdowns. So let me know what you guys think. Cause if you guys like longer videos, I'll do them longer. Uh, if you guys like shorter videos, then I'll try to cap them off at 20 minutes. But that being said, this is the end of the MMA hoodie fight predictions for UFC Vegas 17 Thompson versus Neil. I am the MMA hoodie. Peace out guys. Thank you.